Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am not Jason Downing. My name is Stan DeJarnett, and I'm the vice chair of the state board, uh, but it's uh, Mr. Downey's been called away on a family emergency. Our thoughts are with him and his family. Uh, so I'll be pinch hitting for him, for Jason today. And uh, with five former chairs seated here at the table, <laughs> I'm going to be well chaperoned. So uh, I want to call this meeting to order. Uh, we appreciate the fact that those of you who are in the audience have taken the time and the, to be with us this morning. We also uh, want to thank those of you that are watching us uh, online, streaming. Um, and I want to thank the staff for everything they've done to prepare for today's meeting. We will start our meeting today with an inspiration. And as luck would have it, this is my month to have the inspiration. So I'm going to move to that podium if you'll just give me a minute. I see those of you who are uh, watching online are, are probably wondering what's coming next. But, um, and those, I know that those of you that know me well are probably even more nervous. Uh, but we're going to stick to the script today. Um, we, uh, we alternate as board members with the opportunity to bring a speaker or speakers to uh, speak to the board on matters of importance to the board. Also, we seek to inspire others to action. Um, last week, I attended a forum that was uh, sponsored by the Georgia Partnership for Excellence in Education, and I know that we have Dr. Robert Gaines with us here this morning, who moderated that panel. It was a panel discussion between the superintendent candidates. Uh, but before they got to that part of the program, they talked about some of the issues that uh, are on everyone's mind here regarding public education in Georgia. And at the very top of that list was mental health. Um, that gave me a reminder um, because as a former school leader, as a former teacher, uh, working with children, working with staff, working with families, and hearing from constituents all over the state, I think all of us know that this is an issue in the state. I know the Georgia General Assembly has recognized that. Uh, we recognize it here. Well, it's my good fortune to um, have married up uh, in life and uh, outkicked my coverage, as we say. And I am a very proud father to three very outstanding daughters, one of whom lives in the Augusta area. And uh, Without belaboring the point, you'll hear a little bit from her and her husband in just a couple of minutes. They have gotten very involved with the Children's Hospital of Georgia in Augusta that is attached to Augusta University. And I've had the opportunity and the privilege to meet the new director of the Pediatric Behavioral Health and Wellness Center at the Children's Hospital. And it is my privilege this morning to invite Dr. Valera Hudson and her colleague, Catherine Stewart, who is the Director of Philanthropy. And I would like to call them to the podium this morning because they have the inspiration. Dr. Hudson, welcome to Atlanta. And please. So Catherine was my, um, my co-pilot to get here this morning. So uh, <laughs> thank I'm going to let her take it from here. But she's going to let me take it from here. So uh, good morning. Thank you all. I am indeed honored to have the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, and I have to start by saying that I, I would not be where I am today without having had the foundation and education that I received from the public health system in Richmond County. 
um, that uh, foundation, that love of learning was embedded in me through some very key teachers and I have the highest respect for what you all do in providing education for our children um, going forward and, and all that you all did to support me in my academic career. Um, you all, as, as was just mentioned, I recognize that you all have been as challenged as we have in the healthcare system with the uh, mental health crisis that we have. And I appreciate the opportunity to share with you some of the things that we're trying to do from the medicine side to help address that because we know it's, it's a challenge. Um, I am the pediatrician in chief at the Children's Hospital of Georgia. Um, I have the privilege of coming to work every day to focus on improving the health and well being of children. Uh, we do that through uh, three uh, primary uh, pillars, if you will. Uh, we provide direct patient care, uh, but we are part of Augusta University and the Medical College of Georgia and have a responsibility as the academic health system of Georgia to prepare the workforce for the future. So we provide education uh, to uh, students, residents across the whole health field. Um, and then we also are involved in advancing the field. So uh, scholarship and research is very important part of ultimately improving the health and well-being of children. Um, I have to take a few minutes because I know many of you may not be familiar with the Children's Hospital of Georgia, and I think it's a, it's a resource for our state that everyone needs to be aware of. Um, so uh, just briefly, we've actually been caring for kids in the Augusta area since 1910. We've been in our current building for uh, over 20 years. Um, but we are the second largest children's hospital in Georgia, and we are the only children's hospital in Georgia outside of Atlanta that can provide the highest level of care for the sickest and most complex children. We have the highest level uh, neonatal intensive care unit, the highest level pediatric intensive care unit, trauma center, 24-7 uh, uh, pediatric emergency room, ground and air transport. And we are um, also uh, proud to say that we're uh, one, the only place in Georgia that I'm aware of where a mom can deliver her baby and if that baby needs a higher level of care, they stay under the same roof. So that is, uh, makes us a little bit unique in what we can provide. And I'm not gonna read the rest of the numbers of what we do, but that's a very high overview. Um, people may think that we um, only serve our primary, secondary, and tertiary areas that you see there. We are right on the Savannah River. So we do uh, have some, uh, uh, we do serve children from across the river. Um, actually, the Kisners live in Aiken, South Carolina, which is right across the river from us. Um, but we serve all of Georgia. Um, you will hear our dean talk about Georgia being our classroom with our regional campuses. To me, Georgia is my waiting room. I feel very responsible that we have an, op uh, an obligation to serve the healthcare needs of children in what we refer to as the rest of Georgia. So Children's Healthcare of Atlanta does an excellent job of providing care for the large population of children that are in the metropolitan area. Uh, but Georgia is a big state, as many of you know, and so we have some challenges with providing access. This is a heat map just of inpatients that are served, and you can see that we serve children throughout the state and across into South Carolina and even across the region. And for some of our services, we have uh, patients who come from other countries. Um, we are fortunate to have a Ronald McDonald House that's um, a pitching wedge if you're Kevin Kisner from the front door of our children's hospital, it'd be a driver for me. Um, so families who do have to travel from distance in Georgia uh, can, uh, will have a place to stay if, they, if, they have, if their child has to stay in the hospital. So we're very grateful for that convenience as well. Um, and then this is just the heat map of patients that are served from the, uh, for outpatient services. And again, between the inpatient and outpatient, we serve children from every county in Georgia. As I said, Georgia is my waiting room, and so at, uh, the, from the Children's Hospital of Georgia, we have been very intentional in establishing outreach clinics for pediatric subspecialties, uh, which are in short supply. Um, and so the stars that you see there are places throughout the state that our doctors travel to in order to provide direct services to patients, uh, either directly through on-site, and then also we have an extensive uh, telemedicine a network that, we, that was well established even before the pandemic for providing subspecialty care. So um, I'm gonna uh, focus uh, just a few minutes on what is a shared um, crisis for you all in education, for us in medicine, and that is the children's mental health emergency. So even before COVID, uh, suicide 
uh, was the third leading cause of death among children. That is tragic to me and to you all who care for kids. Um, from your own data from the Georgia Department of Education, uh, in your survey, um, the number of children with depression, anxiety, poor concentration, emotional ability um, has steadily increased. You see this, you live this every day. And in the past year, 11% of children in the sixth through 12th grade reported conducting self-harm, 12% reported seriously considering attempting suicide, and 6% of children, which is nearly 13,000, which again breaks our hearts, reported attempting suicide. And I would dare say that many of you uh, have had the, the tragic occurrence of, uh, of a suicide within your school systems. So one in five Georgia children have one or more emotional, behavioral, or developmental conditions. This is a huge, huge challenge for us. So not reflecting very well on us in the healthcare profession, um, Georgia is at the bottom in access to care for mental health services. We rank 51 out of 51. Um, that is what we are trying to address and trying to partner and trying to um, uh, find ways to um, close that gap and create more access for children to get the health care need that they uh, deserve, um, particularly around mental health. So um, Georgia, again, is a very large state, and so 120 of our rural counties uh, have a mental health a workforce shortage, and the same is true for 30 of our 40 non-rural counties. Um, so, and 14 of our counties have no child and adolescent behavioral health services. So, so we have some work to do to close that gap. And um, there's a couple of, it's, it's going to be a multifactorial, multi-pronged approach for us as we try to address this. Um, one of the ways that we are addressing this uh, throughout the state is, uh, is focusing on our, the primary care providers who are already working with these children. So the general pediatricians who were not trained to manage the mental and behavioral health challenges that they're seeing every day in their office. So uh, the Georgia workforce uh, for primary care physicians is, is not uh, as short as the specific mental and behavioral health providers. And we know that there's actually some value in looking to the primary care physicians uh, because they already have those relationships with the families. Pediatricians are specialized in working with families. Uh, the concerns uh, around interpersonal and community factors are known to the pediatricians uh, and, and care in school systems. While uh, part of the health care um, for children uh, is, is disconnected from the families and for interventions to be effective, we really have to engage the families. Uh, Dr. Hartman is a pediatrician um, that I'll mention again in a few minutes who's been part of our initiative in Augusta um, and the, the long lasting relationship that she has with her families uh, really has been a key to success. So um, there is an organization called REACH, which is Resource for Advancing Child's Health. Um, they are a nonprofit organization that was founded to ensure that the most effective, scientifically proven mental health care can get to children and their families. Um, and so this uh, institute offers training for pediatricians, for primary care physicians, that's called Patient Centered Mental Health in Pediatric Primary Care, or Triple P uh, for short. Um, their experience, their data has shown that this can transform the practice of primary care physicians that allows them to begin to provide some of the initial uh, help that uh, is needed in addressing mental and behavioral health problems. So we are uh, fortunate um, that uh, we have been able to, through philanthropy, we've been able to begin to offer this training to pediatricians in our state. So there was an anonymous donor uh, in the Atlanta area who, uh, provide, who provided uh, 150 uh, training slots to pediatricians in the greater Atlanta area, to which we replied, what about the rest of Georgia? Um, and so through a coalition uh, or a, a collaboration between the Pediatric Healthcare Improvement Coalition and Resilient Georgia, we have been able to uh, uh, put together um, uh, grant requests to find other ways to fund this training for pediatric primary care providers in outside of, of Atlanta. Our, our goal is to get this training to as many pediatricians throughout the state as we can. 
And this is just one comment from a pediatrician in Georgia who uh, had the opportunity to take this training, and um, she says that it just significantly increased her confidence in being able to treat mental health conditions. Um, she's seen her patients transformed as they get the help they need without having to wait the months and months to get an appointment with a psychiatrist or a psychologist, um, and they come back to her office in their visits different, um, and it's been life-changing for her practice. Um, as was mentioned, we are very fortunate at the, in, the children, at the, in the Children's Hospital of Georgia to have partnered with the Kevin and Brittany Kisner Foundation. Um, they came to us a couple of years ago, even before the pandemic, to say, we, we want to be part of improving the health of children in our community. How can we partner to you? What is your greatest need? And even before the pandemic, behavioral and mental health was our greatest need. And so they have been very generous in committing uh, $5.3 million to help us establish a Center for Pediatric Development, Behavioral Health and Wellness. Um, our um, intent for this, as you would imagine, is we, we want to have better health, better wellness for the youth in our area and beyond um, so that they can uh, become the productive adults that we want them to be. Uh, this requires that we find better uh, and more efficient ways to coordinate care. Uh, we want to be effective in the treatment that's provided and with compliance and completing those treatment programs. Um, and mostly we know that these services are needed to help reduce the parental stress and frustration that they have in trying to uh, get the care for their children. So this is just a visual of the center um, as it currently exists. Um, and each of those red check marks are parts of the center that were made possible uh, that we were able to accelerate uh, and to develop uh, only because of the generous support of the Kisner Foundation. Uh, so we have a comprehensive um, uh, integrated behavioral health uh, practice uh, for our, for our, within our pediatric practice that started with a core group that we will be expanding to all of our other pediatricians as they get the training that I mentioned earlier uh, and then have developed some other components to expand what we can offer for behavior and mental health challenges. Um, we, uh, uh, again, are grateful for that, and I don't know that they were able to get the video <coughs> to play. They cannot get the sound, which I regret. Um, this is a video that Kevin and Brittany did uh, last year uh, to present to their foundation and as part of their fundraiser, and embedded within that is, is the personal story of one of the patients who has already uh, benefited from this. Um, I think we can send the link out to uh, everyone who's here, um, or you can Google it yourself. It's on YouTube. Uh, it is worth the four minutes uh, to watch. So um, with that, again, thank you for the opportunity just to uh, give you a little bit of um, insight of what we're trying to do on the um, healthcare side of things. Um, and again, thank you for all that you do in serving children in our state. Dr. Hudson, thank you, um, th and thank you to the board for allowing me this opportunity to showcase the work that's going on. My primary reason for selecting this is not just because I have a moment of personal pride in this, but this is this whole endeavor is personal, not just professional to me. And I, the 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 work, as you can see, being 51st in mental health is not where Georgia wants to be, we're not where Georgia needs to be, and it's certainly not where we are going to be with the kind of work that Dr. Hudson and her team are doing. Uh, any board members have any questions for Dr. Hudson? Um, I will make sure that the video is available for those who wanna see it, um, but I wanna thank you for making the drive early this morning all the way from Augusta, and we really, really appreciate your time. Uh, would you all stand and please join me in the Pledge to the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you.
All right. Uh, we have several guests with us this morning. And uh, if you, I know that some of you would like to introduce your own guests, but uh, I want to make sure that we're uh, we're recognize uh, John O'Connor with the uh, Georgia Dyslexia Collaborative. And I understand we're going to hear from you in just a few minutes. All right, sir. All right. Great. Thank you for being with us, John. Uh, Dr. Claire Buck, the new GASIS Executive Director. Claire, welcome. Catherine Stewart and Dr. Valera Hudson and Ashton Blackwood, you've just met. Um, and two good friends of mine, uh, Rick, Ricky McCorkle, who is the Chattahoochee Flint RESA Director, and Tim Helms, who's the Southwest Georgia RESA Director. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for making the drive. Uh, we have Ty Tagami with the AJC. Jeanette Hollum, East Coweta Middle School. Welcome. <coughs> Elgin Mayfield, Bonaire Primary School in Houston County. Sean Harrelson, Superintendent in Lowndes County School District. Morning, Sean. Al Beaver, the Executive Director of the Georgia Association of Elementary School Principals. Dr. Robert Gaines, the Director of External Affairs for the Georgia Partnership for Excellence in Education. Welcome, Robert. Dr. Greg Arnsdorf with Cognia. Justin Pauley, an old colleague. Well, he's not old, but he's a longtime <laughs> colleague with the Georgia School Boards Association. Welcome, Justin. Bonnie Knight with Foothills Charter. Dale Simpson with Foothills Charter. Roger Fitzpatrick, Mountain Ed Charter High School. Roger. Tina Engberg with Decoding Dyslexia. Welcome again, Tina. It's good to see you as always. And Beth Haynes with Decoding Dyslexia, welcome. Krista Pearson with Lowndes High School and Leanne McCall with Lowndes County High School. Welcome to both of you. And an old friend, Alan Long, the Executive Director of the Georgia Association of Secondary Schools Principals. Is there anyone that slipped in that we've missed that didn't sign in? I see Buddy Costley. Welcome, Buddy, from the <laughs> Gale. And Emily Emily, great to see you again as well. Anyone else? All right. Thank all of you for being here. Now uh, it is time for public hearing, and we have one speaker that has signed up to speak. And uh, John, we welcome you. If you step to the podium, you'll have three minutes to make your comments. And we look forward to hearing. Thank you for being here again. Sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is John O'Connor. I am the co-chair of the Georgia Dyslexia Collaborative. Um, I chair that organization with Sarah Burbach, a longtime hero in education across the state. Um, and we established the Dyslexia Collaborative a couple of years ago when the law passed. And we have representatives on our committee from a wide variety of professional organizations. And instead of naming all of them, I'll just hit the highlights, the professional organization from element, elementary school principals, school speech pathologists, MTSS professionals, RTI professionals, school psychologists, special ed leaders, and of course teachers. And we have been meeting almost two years monthly and have also done some drive-in um, trainings. And let me start by saying we fully support this rule. Um, we urge you to sign it, um, we uh, um, approve it, um, we feel it's in the right place. Um, it's hit that sweet spot, hit that target of what we want, that combination of um, expectations with some details, but not too much details, right? Because we want schools to be able to make decisions on kids. I have to brag on the game changer that happened. You guys know it's been a long process over the last couple of years. Um, but I have to brag on um, all of you for your support of students with dyslexia, but also for four specific board members, Ms. Rice, Ms. Kenamore, Ms. Perry, and Mr. Mason. Um, you guys 
uh, established a committee to get together and said, with all of these conversations, let's get folks together. And maybe there were 25 people there. There were great colleagues. There were parents of kids with dyslexia. There were representatives from our private schools who've been doing this work. There were other professional organizations. There were lots of represent representatives from public schools. And over three meetings, guess what we found out? We were all very much on the same page. We just had to talk it through. We really came to a lot of recommendations fairly easy, like let's remove this from the SST rule. And what's the balance between really providing clear expectations without being too prescriptive so folks are, it's generating too much paper and processes and not enough time with kids. Um, I know I learned a lot from the committee. It was enormously collaborative and I hope folks uh, learn from all of us. But that was the game changer. So thank you for those board members who led it. Stephen Pruitt from SREB came in and facilitated three powerful meetings. So we urge you to approve this. Um, as they say, now the work begins. Um, and we'll be glad to provide recommendations very clearly about the ELA standards that are being developed. Everyone in that committee said the first thing is tier one core instruction for every, si excuse me, every single child. That's the answer, because we have more research on how kids learn to read in K through three than any other field in education by a bunch. In fact, if you compare the research on K through three reading ELA instruction to all the other research in education, you'd have more here. So that should, folks who are developing the standard should absolutely be knowledgeable about that and trained on that. If we do that well, we can collapse some assessments. We're still having a lot of assessments with our K through three kids, it, like the EIP checklist, the dyslexia screener, which is absolutely a good thing, um, and G kids for kindergarten. Like if we align the standards, we can streamline some of that stuff. It's also things like consistency. Um, training from here, training from Reese's should be focused on that science of reading, what we know about how kids learn to read. But that's kind of getting looking forward a little bit. I urge you and I thank you so much for your dedication to all kids and kids with dyslexia. Um, I, I've been around a long time and one of the most powerful things I've attended were those three committee meetings from folks from all perspectives and experiences and so um, we urge you to approve this rule. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for your comments. <clears throat> And thank you to the board members that he referenced, Ellen, Lisa, Kenneth, Bennett. Thank you for the work that you did to get us to this point. Uh, we're going to now turn our attention to uh, building our agenda for today's meeting. Got to close the hearing. Pardon? Got to close the hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, will declare the public hearing closed. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> Now, we'll turn our attention to building our agenda. Uh, I'd like to call first on the Budget Committee Chair, Matt Donaldson. Mr. Donaldson. Mr. Vice Chairman, Budget Committee met yesterday and advanced items 1 through 12 to the consent agenda. Items 1 through 12. All right. Next, I'll turn to the Rules Committee Chair, Ms. Fenna Petty. Ms. Petty? Yes, the Rules Committee met yesterday. We only had one on our agenda and we are very proud and pleased to uh, say that the dyslexia rule is ready today and it will be approved for a separate vote. All right. Thank you very much. Next, the District Flexibility and Charter Schools Committee. Mr. Sweeney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the uh, District Flexibility and Charter School Committee met yesterday and is advancing items one through four to the consent agenda. Items one through four. Thank you very much. Uh, the Audits Committee, is there a report or anything that we need to add to the agenda from the Audits Committee, Mr. No, Mr. Chair, there are no items needing action from the Audit Committee. All right. And State Schools Committee, just to make sure I don't miss something, are we? is there anything we need to add on to the agenda from State Schools? Nothing from State Schools. Okay. I know that we have some... Uh, do we, I think we have some waivers. Uh, Mr. Benton, 
Are you with yes. me? Uh, would you like to uh, help us with the, uh, add these items to the agenda, please? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. I wish that I was there, but I had something come up. Um, I'd like to make a recommendation to move the following items to the consent agenda. The individual student waivers, the minutes of the July 20th, 2022 executive session, the minutes of the July 20th through 21st, 2022 state board meeting, the August 2022 personnel report, and last, the August 2022 legal report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Benton. All right. Uh, those of you that are in the audience, if you'll give us a few minutes, we'll build the agenda. So we will go into recess for, uh, let's say, 10 minutes. You think 10 minutes will do it? All right. We'll reconvene at 945. We're in recess.
Just an observation, but board members are hard to corral. I'm telling you. And I will admit, Richard probably feels the same way. When I was a superintendent, I didn't look for them as hard as I do now. <laughs> if they weren't there, we went on without them. But um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I really appreciate uh, you folks and those of you that are joining us virtually uh, being here. And uh, I think we have an agenda in front of us now. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Tiffany, for getting this done. Um, I will now entertain a motion. We are back in session, by the way. Uh, I will entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. So I do for a second. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Donaldson made the motion. Mr. Sweeney seconded. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? All right, the agenda is approved. I will now, uh, as you see, we have a lengthy consent agenda in front of you, so I'll give you one little minute to take, make sure that it's, everything's in order. And uh, when you're ready, I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved, Martha Zoller. Thank Second. you, Martha. Second for Mr. Royal. Discussion. Any discussion? I do want to point out one thing on here. It's yeah. not really because it dovetails with our inspiration this morning. I want to thank the governor's office as well. On this consent agenda is the grant acceptance for the school-based health care centers for our Title I schools. There were 14, you know, according to that slide, which is, is accurate, there are 14 counties that have no access at all and then many, many more that have minimal access. This is a great opportunity. It's $125 million. It's going to be made available to change the lives of children. And we have an opportunity to uh, do something great and help, help with that right there. Many of, this, many of the counties that are in that, in that map are Title I counties, almost all of them, actually. And this is going to be a great opportunity, and we need to be very deliberate in how we how we manage this as a board and, and help change the lives for many of those kids. Thank you, Mr. Royal. Any other discussion? All right. All in favor of approval of the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion passes. Uh, we have one rules committee item on the agenda, and as I, everyone is aware, it is the adoption of the State Board Rule 160-4-2-.39, the Dyslexia Identification and Support Rule. I'll entertain a motion to approve this rule. Motion. Second. Motion by Mr. Donaldson, second by Ms. Petty. Any discussion? Folks, it's been two years. And as Mr. Mason said back in the uh, green room back here during the break, we're just, and, and as Mr. O'Connor said, the work is just starting. That's right. All in favor of the approval of this rule, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please aye. signify. All right. The motion, the rule passes unanimously. Thank you very, very much. I will now turn it over to Superintendent Richard Woods for the superintendent's report. Thanks, sir. Richard. Well, this morning we have a, a couple of presentations, uh, but one to start off with I think uh, is extremely uh, very uh, you know, pleasing to me as an educator, uh, as a former administrator. Uh, today we're going to recognize, uh, I guess, national recognized or national awarded uh, you know, administrators both at the uh, assistant principal and principal level today. 
uh, quite uh, an accomplishment. I, I think that uh, if you've ever had the honor of being an administrator, you know, that's a, that's a daily grind uh, because everything falls at your feet. Uh, and there are days which you don't know what's going to land at your feet, to be honest. Uh, but uh, we don't turn anyone away. And to be honest, I, you know, I, I think that as a person who looks at leadership, I, you know, I'm always, uh, you know, kind of reminded of what uh, uh, John Maxwell always says, that everything rises in, or either falls at leadership. And that is so much, you know, true of what we're looking at. Because these individuals, uh, they're in the school every day. They are the CEO of that school every day. Uh, and what that environment looks like, what takes place, the expectation, uh, you know, the, I guess the collaboration, uh, and everything involved within that, uh, you know, falls at, at the feet of this leadership. And that's how important it is, uh, because they will set the tone. One of the things I know, I, you know, Michael and I were you know, talking last night, you know, for me being a coach, and you can say that these individuals definitely are head coaches, you know, in their field, in their schools. Uh, you know, for me as, as, you know, thinking about that and being a former coach, uh, you know, I tell people, I said, you could have a basketball team. And if I had a basketball team and, and I got to choose my, my player, you know, I could have a team that everybody's name was either LeBron James or Michael Jordan. On paper, I should win every game. There should not be a reason that nobody could touch me. But I would say this, if I'm the leader and the head coach of that team and I'm making all the right call or all the wrong calls, then Michael and LeBron look like Richard trying to play ball. <laughs> and that means we're not going to win a game, you know, during that call. You know, and that's the importance of leadership uh, because you will never exceed that person's ability to lead. They will put a cap on what can and cannot take place within their schools. And today it, it uh, is, you know, I'm pleased to recognize individuals that have set an infinite ceiling of success. And because of that, that's why they're here. That's why their schools perform at an amazing level. So uh, without further ado, we're gonna introduce our elementary first. So I think uh, Dr. Hal Beaver, you wanted to come up and say a few words to your folks. <clears throat> I want to thank the uh, Superintendent Woods and, and the board for allowing me to say a few things to a few folks. First of all, each year in Georgia, we're the largest school east of the Mississippi River, our largest state. We have the sixth largest public school system in the nation, so people do look to us about what we do and what we do for our people and students here in Georgia. Um, this past year, uh, and each year we select one principal out of the over 1,300 elementary schools to be our national distinguished principal. And this year we have selected, and he has been honored, and he'll get to go to Washington, D.C., and our Secretary of Education will uh, greet him, and he'll get an award at, in D.C. And our national distinguished principal this year was Dr. Elgin Mayfield from Houston County, and I know he's back there, but if he'll walk up here, I would appreciate that. And. Uh, for your present. <laughs> I would like to say this, that school principals commit their professional lives to educational excellence. And um, he's an influencer. He's pivotal in what he does at his school. He's opened two or three schools in Houston County. Um, but he commits his, his whole personal life. And I think it's better to serve for others than for self. And I think Elgin does that. Um, and uh, 
and I think it's nice just to say that we recognize our school people because we don't do that enough because uh, they do serve our, our children in Georgia. And quickly, I'd like to, to mention uh, uh, Denise Reynolds. She is our National Outstanding Assistant Principal in Dawson County, but she couldn't be with us here today. So I'd like to mention her name. And uh, thank you, Dr. Woods. Okay, appreciate sure. it. Thank you very much. And you'll do this one here. Okay, Again, for middle school, uh, you know, I, actually, I, I've worked at the high school level and I worked at the uh, uh, elementary level. I, I've never figured out middle school. Uh, you know, I think that is a special calling in itself when you deal with, with young people who are perhaps still children in many ways but yet they're growing into adults. And I think of all the changes that take place during that, that age. So I, I, I think there's a special calling for any individuals that there. Uh, but with us today, we want to recognize the esteemed Georgia Middle School Principal of the Year, and that's uh, Dr. Uh, Jeanette is it Hallam, I think. I believe yes, all right. So come on, please. Last but not least, uh, again, the place that, that I really call home was at the high school level. I had the pleasure of uh, being a, a teacher there. And I can tell you that, you know, the administrator did make a difference. Uh, again, Michael and I were talking last night, and, and just being underneath a great administrator allows you to really stretch and, and improve. Uh, as with all these individuals, high school again was my home and, and really enjoyed my time there. So uh, we're going to let uh, Dr. Long come up and we'll let you introduce your individuals and we'll start with the ass assistant there, okay? <clears throat> yeah, we can do that, sure. Good morning and thank you for having us and uh, thank you for what you do. Um, once again, I, I, I copy what Hal says about how important it is to recognize what people do uh, in this profession because uh, it's kind of a thankless job sometimes, as you know, so, so we appreciate you very much. We have a unique situation in GASSP, and let me explain that to you um, because I want to explain it because sometimes in other states, a principal, an assistant principal immediately becomes an assistant principal of the year when the principal of the year is named. That's not the case in Georgia. We, we introduce and, and compete for the assistant principal of the year in November. Uh, so we did that this past November at our fall conference. And, and our winner at that was Krista Pearson from Lowndes High School. Uh, so then uh, we had, in the winter, we compete for our principal of the year. Krista went and competed at the national level in Washington, DC. So when we came back and did our principal of the year, our principal of the year was Leanne McCall from Lowndes High School. First time in the history of GASSP, and I think the first time in the history of Gale with the, with the, uh, the secondary, middle, or elementary association. I think it's the first time we've had that situation. So we call them the dynamic duo. If you're in Savannah this fall and you want something that's really entertaining and really good, come and watch them present together at our fall conference. That's going to be the first time ever, too, and, and we're excited about having them there. But they're a great team. Uh, they're great leaders. Uh, and and as, as I will, our committees that, that, that elected these two, uh, there was a committee of five that elected these two out of three finalists for each one. And they said it was hands down, no question, had to be. And, and then what came back from the national level was professional, cutting edge, and sharp. So I introduced to you uh, Krista Pearson, Assistant Principal of the Year for the State of Georgia and Leanne McCall, Principal of the Year from the State of Georgia. Thank you. 
don't feel good about that. <laughs> And again, if we could give all of our recipients another round of applause. And we wish all of you a very successful school year. I know as we're getting cranked up, uh, you know, our enrollments are kind of changing as we get kids in and out and uh, making, we get our adjustments there, but I expect we'll have a great year and, and hear great things from all of you. So again, thank you for being uh, a representation of what we see across Georgia at large. So we appreciate that. Uh, at this time, Mr. Chair, we have uh, introduced Dr. Keith Osborne. Uh, as said, as promised, I think last month, we wanted to make sure that we brought uh, uh, our uh, CIO uh, in, in front of us uh, to give you a, uh, a little bit of update uh, in his amazing world. They just had their conference, I think, and so come on up, uh, Keith, you're fine. Um, and uh, sharing what's going on, and especially in the area of school safety and things of that nature, uh, you know, definitely data and data breaches and things like that definitely play a part, but uh, Keith and his team do an amazing job and are providing really some amazing services for our districts and even for us internally. And so without further ado, uh, Keith, we'll turn it over to you, sir. Appreciate you, sir. Uh, good morning, board. Good morning, good morning. board. Uh, thank you in advance. Let me get a PowerPoint set up. Uh, that seems to be um, obligatory, if you will, in this day and age that you have to have PowerPoint in front of you. Uh, and, and in advance of that, I'll tell you too, um, I was in Washington, D.C. last week and all the states were giving updates on things that we were doing and people were talking about, you know, what, what's one of the most valuable skills that you think you offer and have? And, and I really said, you know, I gotta be honest with you. I said, I think one of my strongest skills is something called uh, filibuster into submission. Um, and um, uh, Matt heard that and he said, listen, he said, if you try and attempt that today, he said, your next project is going to be to catalog unique slow snowflake designs in Siberia. So uh, <laughs> with that being said, I have about 10 minutes to kind of give you some updates. I uh, certainly thank you board in advance. Uh, as, as I talk about this, I want to talk um, and say that, you know, the, the alignment of, of the superintendent's initiatives you know, supported by the board validated through through our staff and teachers uh, does enable mighty works to be done and so today I wanted to show you a couple of things that really have uh, begun to kind of govern the work that we do uh, but I really want to start off by saying certainly that uh, in technology services our mission is to is to connect what matters uh, and we're driven by about five core values that you see up there on the screen everything that we do uh, plays into this and it is woven into the work that we do all of this aligns always uh, to the department's uh, strategic plan uh, and then is supported by key documents that we see along and along. And a perfect example of that would be something like the superintendent's reimagining document, uh, which was pivotal for us and it literally became a North Star, as you've heard me say so many times, uh, and, and wanted to demonstrate an example of one of the initiatives that came from that, which is very empowering. Uh, and it's something that we're about to release. Uh, certainly you will see this as the superintendent will beforehand. Uh, and that was that within that, uh, he charged us to begin to look at what does the 21st century look like? What does that environment look like? And specifically, uh, you know, are, are there standards that we need to? Um, and so from that work, we felt impelled to, to go out and find our technology leaders and others from across the state and endeavor to say, can you help us envision what does a 21st century classroom and media center look like? And from that became a report 
uh, that ultimately you'll be getting a report of. We're, we're finalizing that right now, but specifically inside of that, uh, it has now provided for us an opportunity to, to provide a template back to our districts, to our district leaders and our school leaders that now give them an opportunity to say what were the vision of some of our forward-thinking leaders across the state is to begin to imagine what we need to circle around as we endeavor to support our teachers with inside of our classrooms. Uh, an example of that, as you heard Superintendent Woods, which is, a, is in a critical need, and it's really imperative work that we're doing right now, is to support cybersecurity. And as you heard me say earlier, whenever you have a superintendent uh, providing initiatives, whenever you're supported by the board and validated by teachers, we can do amazing things. Uh, the board has supported two initiatives that we've brought, really three that I have up here on the board, but two specifically where we endeavored to, to increase the awareness and provide tools to allow us to mitigate against uh, particular cyber threats, but also support uh, what we know is very near and dear and what I consider to be the most precious thing uh, that, that we are stewardships over, and that is the criticality of student information and the need to prevent um, you know, the, the unauthorized or the misaligned use of that. And so in order to do that, to support our districts, irregardless of size, uh, you, you provided two tools that we've given to our districts. And I'll tell you uh, with great success that we've rolled that out to the majority of the districts that need that. Some districts don't need our help. Uh, they're doing a fantastic job. Others certainly uh, really needed the support and uh, really rallied around the opportunity that we had. Uh, so with massive success, I see you see the two tools, uh, the cybersecurity suite and the email fish campaign. That's rolling out rapidly, and there's just massive uptake around the state. Uh, and so we feel like that we're in a super good position. The last thing, which is critically important right now, to continue on with that work and ensure that we're systemically addressing this ongoing, is that two things that we've initialized on is with our RESA partners, we're providing cybersecurity training at the LEA level for those that need that. Uh, we've started out with two pilots that are well into their um, uh, success rate. Uh, we have three more pilots coming on board, but before it's all said and done, all 16 RESAs will partner with us to provide the cybersecurity training. The two previous tools that you see up there also enabled us to begin providing on-demand professional learning. So we're able to gather information at the state level, obfuscate that, but whenever we identify what we consider to be technical weaknesses around the state, we now rally around. Uh, the Cyber Center is supporting with us and, and uh, as some of the services in GTA, but now we're able to provide targeted on-demand professional learning that enable us to address weaknesses across the criticality of the state. So I set a goal for ourselves. We have a point and I've said, listen, we as, a go we as a team, we're going to reach this next level, and we're going to do that by stair-stepping and increasing the cybersecurity uh, that we see around the totality of the state. Uh, very successful. Again, that would not have happened had it not been for your support and certainly the support of the superintendent. So thank you very much. I um, want to pivot real quick because another document that certainly has guided our work is that uh, the very important teacher burnout report. Um, you know, this is where I believed, and I've mentioned so many times to our team, the technology service has, has not done enough, and we need to do a lot more. And one of the things that we endeavored to do was rally around the idea that technology can support a teacher by giving her back the time to do what she wants and needs to do, and that is to pedagogically address what needs to happen inside of the classroom. So often, as we saw during the pandemic, she was tasked, she literally became the quasi workhorse, if you will. Everything that happened, it seemed to fall on her shoulders, and we said technology services, find what you can, take those things off of her shoulder, and protect the art of teaching. And so I'm going to give you guys a glimpse now. Um, I kind of worked with my team because uh, while I have slides here, um, I'm going to be brave and I'm going to switch over to the tool that you're going to see that's going to very rapidly be released to our teachers. But here was the endeavor behind that, and that's that teachers struggle to find reason. I, I, see, you, I see you smile at me. <laughs> um, teachers struggle to find resources to support their classroom. Um, and you know, we have um, search engines that enable us to find resources on the internet, and sometimes they can be too good. And a perfect example would be a teacher that goes out and says, I want to find third grade social studies resources. And those search engines are good enough to say, okay, I found you approximately 980 million of those resources, here you go. The teacher is really no better off. So we began to think, you know, as part of a modernization initiative, could we find ways to organize, vet, validate, and provide standards-based resources uh, that are immediately applicable and dynamically available based on that teacher's need? 
I'm going to show you a glimpse of that, okay? Okay, so stand on because I'm going to go back to um, um, the live internet for a second and tell you that um, there's a large piece of work uh, that we're going to be releasing. Release. I see everybody smiling. It's like, oh my goodness, I feel like that. That um, I, I've, I've got everybody. So uh, there's a large piece of work called Georgia Connects that's outcoming. What you're looking at right now is a piece called Georgia Inspire. Uh, and this Georgia Inspire was literally that, was that we were thinking about the teacher and specifically here is the opportunity for us to say, could we build a system that is aware of a teacher and who she is and exactly what it is that she teaches so that whenever she logs into the system and she says, I am a third grade social studies teacher, she's immediately met with resources such as you see up there, a curriculum map, course resources, course standards, assessment documents that are not just in their totality but they are specific to third grade social studies. So if she sees course resources, or if she sees course standards, or if she sees even the assessments of that, you see that what she's met with are those things that are applicable to third grade social studies. This is a collective work of the Department of Education. You know, superintendent has charged us to say, work collectively, don't be siloed in this. And again, this is where technology is the thread that we can enable all of our departments. So you see these resources are ones that come from our accountability and assessment team, but they are very much related to that. So if I go back here, this is where it really, really gets good because you know, certainly within uh, Dr. Dooley's team where they endeavor to template things like curriculum guides, which are very, very useful either for our beginning teacher or our master teacher. What if we could go into that particular unit and you see that we began to to, to descript and, and provide the individuality of what's happening in regard to that uh, and, and get to the uniqueness of, of saying peer teacher or the opportunity for you to have standards aligned resources for third grade social studies. We've already done the work. These are resources created by Georgia educators aligned to our Georgia standards of excellence. What technology services has endeavored to do is recalibrate engines and systems so that we can do the work here. And how cool is this? Instead of saying, teacher, you go do this work, I gave you that in three mouse clicks and I did it in less than 10 seconds. Have we supported our teachers? We hope so. Uh, we certainly are enabling them now to begin to see some of these resources and say, uh, how can we do a better job? Because I think that we're only scratching the surface of what we're endeavoring to do in this regard. So. Um, when it's all said and done, she herself will ultimately have the ability to come in and fine tune this and make it specifically what she'd like to have in that regard. So, so with that, let me go back to the PowerPoint because I, I think I might be close to my time and I don't want to go to Siberia. Uh, and so, uh, I'm gonna jump through this real quick and go. Uh, another piece of work that certainly has um, uh, enabled us to better support the teacher is our Georgia Learns platform. Board, you supported this and we're in our second year of this. We think this is a massive success and we looked for the opportunity to build an enterprise system, a state level resource that will enable staff, not just teachers, but school leaders and all the staff to say, uh, we have to remain consistent with, with new information and, we, and our skill sets have to stay current. So what we've endeavored to do with our Georgia Learns platform is, is rally around them and provide a myriad of resources, one of which you see here, which is our, our opportunity for professional learning, irregardless of what they do within a school. It could be transportation, it could be nutrition, or as you see here, it could be something like one of our ELA teachers or, or one of our math teachers that need professional learning that is targeted, laser focused to specifically what it is. The uniqueness of this platform, however, is that we're endeavoring now to measure professional learning over time. And that's why you see that we're going to provide badging, is that we're looking at this at a significantly more granular level. We don't just say a teacher has been in a dramatic writing course, where we're able to look at the contents within this and say specifically in these areas, this is where we've endeavored to support her or build her skill set and her ability to, to better deliver to her students. Massively successful work that we think and that continues to grow. Uh, monthly, we're seeing more and more of our educators. We've built a system fully capable of supporting the entirety of staff across the state of Georgia to support that. A, a second component of that is that we're now working, uh, Dawn Ashmore's in the room, she and the team have been working specifically to make sure that we put relevant information organized and immediately available. 
We don't want people having to go out and search to find those things. We've got good resources. We can support teachers. What they've needed from us is for us to organize that information in a palatable and a consumable fashion so that it's immediately available for them. Here's an example of a professional learning series now, which you see that we're able to, again, over the course of time, provide a myriad of resources um, that all collectively together support the need that she has. Data. You know, superintendent has charged us oftentimes to say, you know, we, we have a massive amount of data. And one thing that the pandemic showed us is that we can do things with that data. But the initiative here is how do we move beyond just compliance based <clears throat> reporting? Certainly there are state laws, there are board policies that you initialize that enable us to go out and collect the data. But I've, I've cautioned our team to say collecting data for the simplicity of providing a report provides little value other than a summative report of how we did. Teachers aren't interested in that. They want to know how we are doing. And so the idea is say, how do we move from the summative to the formative conversation of being able to support her with data driven? An example of this is, a, is the report that you see that otherwise was the technology inventory. But here where we are endeavoring to support the school leader, who certainly in this day and age, because of the ongoing effects of, of, of changes that, that were brought about with the pandemic, is that a school leader has to at any given moment in time say, do I need to shift my learning modality from in-person to hybrid or hybrid to virtual? In order to do that, uh, they have to be informed with things like, do I have enough bandwidth? Do we have enough devices? And so these are applications that we're using the modernization effect to say that we're summative in design are now evergreen in application. So our technology leaders are now trained to go in and update this with a regular and increasing frequency so that a school leader can now go in and literally have data to inform their decision-making capabilities. This is one example of that. Another uh, would be you know, an initiative that is near and dear to the superintendent's heart. Um, and this is the work of Jessica Booth, of our fine arts program manager, who said, um, how are we doing in the world of fine arts? And where is it at across the totality of the state? So we could work. Uh, she she kind of commissioned this work. We needed a place for that. The previous dashboard that you see coupled with this one is found within our Georgia Insights platform. By the way, it will ultimately be a component of this um, Georgia Connects project that we're talking about because again, irregardless of teacher, school leader, or staff, we wanted one common place where people could go and find information relevant to their need and the work that they do. Here, was, here coupled with the other that you see, the Georgia Insights platform is gonna be a kind of a subsidiary of that. So. Um, last but not least, last slide, and then um, my, I'll probably have like six minutes left to answer questions, uh, is something that we recognized during the pandemic, and that was this need for a collaborative and safe space for not just our teachers, but our school leaders, for our staff to be able to ask very organic questions about what their needs are at that immediate time. And so uh, we commissioned a work that we now collectively call the Godot Community. Uh, largely successful and well over 100 groups, near and closer to 200 as we speak, is this opportunity for specific conversations around say technology leadership or sixth and seventh math or, or, or social studies or, or second grade literacy skills. These are all topics that enable those specifics that have that question to come in and say, can I have a protected space upon which we can have an organic ongoing conversation that over the course of time enables us to, as a collective, address our own needs and answer what we have within uh, uh, you know, our schools, irregardless of our location. And so this is wildly successful there again. Um, and, and so with that, you know, I, I'm, I've scratched the thumbnail. Um, you know, I tell my team all the time, have I given you too many ideas? Jay Heap, who's my associate superintendent, uh, Jay will always come back and I'll say, Keith, I'll never do 100% of what you do. He says, but I'll do 40% more of what we would have done um, had it not been for somebody coming in. And so uh, I keep us tuned. Um, the work that we do, I tell my team is urgent. Um, I believe in the power of teachers. I believe in the power of technology services to support our teachers and our workforce that exists out there. And so with that, I'll, I'll answer um, any questions that you might have, so. Any questions for Keith? Good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you hit on uh, one item in particular that struck me. I mean, I think this material is amazing, by the way. But, um, on the email fish campaign, the, yes, sir. the training element. Yes, sir. So I think we all know that you've got to be very, very careful about clicking on links or opening attachments. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but if you suspect that you have a phish email, what's the best way to share that with somebody on the technology team? Um, so, I've heard like doing screenshots and forwarding a screenshot absolutely. rather than forwarding the email. So. It, it, indeed, absolutely. From that endeavor, the other is that um, uh, Chris Healy and his team have we've specifically uh, added a feature with an email that allows them to just simply instead of forwarding that email, just click on a button that says "I report this as fish." Um, you know, because again, the awareness piece. Um, if I kind of use the example of this, right, is that, um, you know, most of the time, so 94%, so by the way, of cyber uh, kind of attacks happen simply because of that. You're, you're, you're spot on is that, and again, I'm not saying that people are malicious in nature, it's just the, the true nature. You know, you walk in at seven o'clock tonight and the, the TV's blurring and the dog's barking and you realize that you gotta take out the trash and, um, you know, all these things are happening and I say, oh, look, I got an email from Michael and I click it. And I, and I didn't think to check that, but as it is, it's somebody that spanned his email. So, so that's the biggest threat. And so obviously the, the biggest thing that we train around is this <clears> idea <throat> of awareness of saying, irregardless of time, space, and place, think. But whenever that happens, which is your question, whenever I recognize that there's something abnormal about this, what do I do? And so those are things that we try and train our staffs uh, and some of the, 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 provide, the, the training that we provide in regard to them is to say things like, yeah, we, we would rather see a screenshot, certainly don't open it. And if it has some kind of like a payload or attachment, obviously don't click on that. Uh, you know, we try to develop the muscle memory of saying, irregardless of just clicking on anything, click on that fish button. And our team has resources and tools that enable us to kind of offload that, look at that report and determine if it's safe or whatnot. Uh, other things that we do, by the way, system-wise, is that we have sentinels that are in place before that email arrives. Now, caution. We don't read everybody's email. There's way too many emails that are passed daily for us to read that, but we do have systems that can look for anomalies and, and pieces of code that really just kind of stick out like a sore thumb. And we're able to kind of provision, a, 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 again, a sentinel that looks at those pieces of code. Those are some of the training pieces through the cybersecurity suite that you all provided that enable us to in advance of those emails and things and those threats arriving <coughs> that enable our technology teams around the state to be aware uh, that something's not right within the system. Everything from measuring bandwidth or seeing blips on the radar in regard to that, all the way down to doing unique things like, uh, you know, the website not presenting itself right, which could very well be related to why an email comes in and a fish in that regard. So I know, I know that probably didn't, that probably sounded way too political, like I was filibustering you and I was not. Uh, but, you know, those, that's certainly one of the things that we're uh, continuing to learn about. How's the best way to address staff? Because there's... <coughs> On the state, there's 300,000 staff members. There's there's 5,000 technology workforce, and so we we've got to use systems as ways well, because so, we can't uh, organically have face time with everybody around the state. And then, um, I I know that that works on the desktop side, but uh, does that work on the mobile side? As it does well? absolutely indeed. Yeah, we we watch everything from that space. So, our job is to protect you all so that you don't have to worry about that as much as we can. One more question. Sure. Um, uh, on the curriculum maps, yes, you know, we kind of think as curriculum being um, led uh, by the LEAs mm -hmm. primarily. And I mean, this is not a top down approach. This is just a resource tool more so than anything else. Absolutely. So um, we, we, we vehemently defend that Georgia is a local control state. A superintendent, a school leader knows more about their schools and their needs than do I. And so this idea is simply to say, can we support you? You know, so many times, um, Prior to this, we always, whenever we needed something new, we always started at 0%. So my endeavor is to say, can I get you at 60% or 70%, then I have literally saved you uh, just an amalgam of time. So I can get you that much closer to what you need to then ultimately design as your unique need within your district or school. That's what we're positioning ourselves to do is to, to really support that. So. Awesome. Any other questions from Keith? Or thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Mason. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Um, great idea. Are you piloting? <clears throat> or is it, when will it be live? Mm. <laughs> Where do you, like, just pitch it out there for uh, projection? 
right around the corner. Um, now you want that time, right? Right. What's right uh, no, I don't the want specific. No, just no, piloting. No, no literally, idea. we're here. So, and I'll tell you. So, there's been design in that. So, um, I, we we realize that there's a specific cadence that we need to use. It, it would be it would be horrible for me to go to a, two, a, a teacher in in December, the first week in December, and say I got this new cool tool because she's going to say, go away come back in three weeks because that's whenever I'm going to do my design. So our cadence typically follows the, the start of semester. However, in this particular case, because the design has been so fast and so critically important uh, that we needed to make sure that we got in front of our curriculum leaders with this so that they're well aware of that. And so specifically, we're kind of targeting that um, with, with Claire's conference that's coming up. Um, that's going to be our, our greatest um, collection of, of academic leaders. We want them to see that. We've already been uh, training the technology workforce to be very, very well of this. Uh, by the way, we've pre-populated this with K-5 content first because we recognize that that's probably the most critical need that we have. Obviously, we all saw during the pandemic that that side of our technology work, excuse me, our teacher workforce was most woefully unsupported. And so during that time, obviously, you know, Associate Superintendent Justin Hill, uh, you've seen the work that he's done there. He and I talked and we targeted what our, our approach was going to be. Uh, and so that's where Georgia Classroom and various things happened in that regard. Meanwhile, we were already beginning the design of this. And so we've repopulated that. Uh, and we're going to be, I think that we're literally at this moment in time at about 85% of all of our K-5 curriculum. We endeavor to have that the day that we release that tool. So I'm saying October-ish. Uh, that we will release that tool with uh, with the idea that we're going to have 100% of the K-5 resources that we have already vetted, already organized, and immediately available for these teachers to use. Um, this is, um, we, we use something that's called a, an, an agile workflow, and, and basically what that means is I ask for a minimum viable product with the idea of saying, give us something. You know, the ability to get from, from nothing to great is, is highly influenced by giving somebody something to look at. And in this case, you know, it, it would be woefully wrong for me to design a tool and take it to the teachers and say, here's your fix. Instead, I want to design a tool that I give to teachers and who come back to me and say, here's the fix. So that's the idea here is, is, is providing a tool and then we're going to be uh, allowed, allowing our workforce <coughs> to heavily influence the next design phases of this. Over the course of time, I'll tell you, uh, this system is going to be fully aware of a teacher, who she is, where she is, what she teaches, and who her students are so that we can dynamically use the modernized uh, systems that we have in place to automatically do the work that heretofore has been laden on her shoulders. So we're going to support her. I said it before, I'm going to say it again. I'm a huge fan of teachers. we got to support them. And my, me and my team, that, that is our ultimate goal and our mission right now is to design systems to do just that. Ms. Kenamore. Yes, Ms. Um, how are you going to push that out? Because I know a lot of things that go out at the superintendent and principal level, sometimes it doesn't get down to the classroom. So I was just wondering how are you going to push that out so that everybody has an opportunity to know what's out there so they can use it for So um, it, while, I, while I do believe in, in kind of a, a, a waterfall methodology, I, I think a superintendent needs to be aware of the things that we're doing. Certainly a school leader does, and, and as you heard, our academic leaders. But meanwhile, uh, you know, the preparation of teachers uh, to feel comfortable with this is, is critically important. And so these are going to kind of occur in tandem. You know, obviously, our leaders need to be aware of this slightly in front of uh, because they need to know, A, number one, that I'm not creating more work for them, and certainly I'm not spending their money. Uh, because this is something that's being provided by us and certainly supported by the work of ESSER. Uh, but at the end of that, uh, uh, Joyce Bearden, who is our Director for Knowledge and Resource Management, she and her team uh, have already begun uh, to think about the training regimen associated with this and the idea of not just delivering a one and done, but systemically over the course of ongoing time provide support to our teacher workforce so, so that they can not only use this tool, but, but certainly heavily influence the next design phases as we have in this regard. So, so, so again, that's why I said we were kind of stair-stepping this so that uh, in this case, uh, Claire, who's with, with the GACES conference, will have the, the biggest collection of our, of our curriculum leaders. They, they really need to see this first because they, they need to have some awareness before we hand that off to the teachers. So did, did that answer with it? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Any other questions for Keith? I'm not going to Siberia, right? 
Matt. Yes, sir. Can answer an iPad question? <coughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yes, sir. Thank okay. you, Dr. Austin. You're not sending me to Siberia because I'm, <laughs> based on my watch, I've still got two and a half minutes left. So, so. Ford, thank you so much for, for always supporting what we do. Uh, that That's the secret sauce is whenever, as I said it earlier, supported uh, by the superintendent's initiatives, but supported by you, uh, validated by teacher workforce. I'm pointing at Michael, because he and I have spent the week together. Thank you in advance, sir, for all the work that, that you are doing, because you <coughs> truly um, are, are the, the tipping point for education, and I appreciate it. Uh, he, he was with us over at the Data uh, Technology and Cybersecurity Conference that's been going on this week. That's why you saw me coming in yesterday on a, on a three minutes late, because I had been in Athens. Let's not talk about my driving skills, but uh, that be as it is. So, board, thank you much. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir. And principals that are still in the room, uh, I hope you noted that the way that they're looking at this now is they want to get something out there and then let the field tell us how to fix it. I think that's a real different. That's a paradigm shift that I think is going to be really helpful for our teachers and schools. So I hope you'll help us, help Keith and his staff share that message. Uh, and you're in a position to do that. So I'm looking at you to uh, help us send that message. And Dr. Buck as well. I know that he wants the curriculum folks in, involved in this as well as we roll this out. It's going to be a great tool. Superintendent Woods, I'll turn it back over yeah, to you. But again, I appreciate uh, Dr. Osborne. Uh, Actually, I think just as a reassurance on my end, we're not giving it over to the Russians. So, uh, uh, you know, we want to make sure we keep the uh, great talent here. But I think you can you can see what we're endeavoring to doing at the department is to make sure we serve and support our local districts, not to tell them how to do things, but, to, you know, to help uh, provide them a service that's meaningful. I think one of the things you've looked at when I've charged the staff is that, you know, I really want high quality simplicity. I think we don't need to overcomplicate things. I mean, our teachers, as you saw, anybody that engages, uh, you know, on, on this platform, you know, within three clicks, you need to be where you need to be. Uh, time is of the essence. Uh, we don't make, need to make this very challenging. And so, you know, I think that as we continue to work with uh, uh, those in the field, we do want to hear back, as you mentioned, uh, because this is about them. And if we are not providing a service to them, then, you know, we need to rethink anything that we offer uh, across the board. I think when you're talking about looking at training, uh, this is something where we definitely need to, to reach out to, to higher ed as well, to our colleges of education. Uh, this needs to be part of their curriculum, to be honest. It needs to be part of what they need to, that as, as young people enter our workforce, uh, they need to be as trained to, of what we're offering and what's out there. And I think that especially for a first year teacher, there's a lot of good resource here. Um, and as you begin to look at that. so. Uh, you know, we want to continue to provide that service, and I thank uh, Keith and, again, really the entire staff for how they work in a collaborative manner. Um, you know, as I shared again, that we are, you know, you know we're a team up here, and uh, we are only as, as strong as the weakest link. And we have to talk, we have to communicate, um, and, I, you know, uh, once again, you know, focusing on that simplicity, that means that we don't need to be offering the same thing in different platforms in different areas. So, you know, we're doing a, a uh, really yeoman's work in trying to make sure that takes place. But uh, at this time, Mr. Chair, I'll yield the floor, and uh, that is the superintendent's report. Thank you very much, Superintendent Woods. We appreciate this. Um, it is now to uh, any other questions before we move on? Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, it's time for the chair's report, and uh, I, I do want to just, I don't plan to give one, but I do want to give uh, board members an opportunity to make, make comments. Uh, I hope this won't be like sentence prayers where everyone is longer than the one before it. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I know that there are, this has been a very eventful week uh, in some good ways. Uh, today's board meeting, we've crossed a milestone with our dyslexia rule. We've heard some great information uh, from staff, which we do every month. But uh, I know this has also been a sad week for many of us. Uh, but I would like to give any of you that wish to speak an opportunity to make some comment, and I'll entertain that right now. <clears throat> Ms. Petty? Um, first of all, I'd like to um, 
uh, send condolences out to the Deal family. Uh, Sandra Deal was and still is continuing, continuing to be a great leader. She led so many, and she led with a smile. She led with a force of love. Um, always left her presence feeling so much better than I did before I got there. Uh, and Martha had to leave, but she wanted me to read that. Um, she likes to say that Sandra Dill served at the North Hall Middle School when her children were there. She was a teacher at heart, a lady in every sense of the word. She was loved and loved others. Blessings to Governor Dill and his family, and Sandra Dill will be missed, and she will definitely be missed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Diane? Uh, yes, Ms. Rice. Diane. Hey, um, I'd, I'd like to add something to that. Uh, I had the privilege of working with Sandra during the, the tenure with the governor. And I know everybody knows, I mean, she was an amazing uh, lady and a teacher, and it was very evident, evident about her caring for students and for literacy as she drove around Georgia and read in our schools. But uh, I wanted to remind everyone, I served on the um, Fine Arts Committee at the mansion with her, and there's a legacy there, too, memories of the mansion, you know, the story of Georgia's governor's mansion that she compiled. And so as we think about her, not only as a teacher and a, and a wonderful uh, example of, of love and caring for family and, and, and our state, um, she also had penned something with great memories um, in a book. So she will be greatly missed. And our thoughts and prayers go out to Governor Deal and his family. Thank you, Helen. <clears throat> Mr. I, Johnson. I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I always have the memory, as, as many of you do, when, when uh, in 2018, well, many, many memories of Mrs. Deal and our interactions with Governor Deal and, and sweet, sweet Ms. Sandra, as we all call her. But, but in 2018, the National Association of State Boards of Education had their conference in Atlanta, and then NASB came to Atlanta. And as many of you were, were there uh, that were on the board at that time, we approached them and said, hey, would, would you all have a reception for us at the governor's mansion? It's a pretty big deal. We get people from all over the country. And they was like, of course we will. And they, for board members, our colleagues, and and, and from around the country were so impressed that our governor and our first lady would open up the, the mansion to, uh, to us and our colleagues from around the country. And we were just treated with such loving uh, kindness as everyone who, who ever visited the governor's mansion while Sandra Deal uh, was, the, was the ultimate hostess. Uh, did but but I, but I remember that because because uh, it meant something to this board, and uh, and and it was uh, it was it was, we got I heard I was a nasty board member at the time about about how blessed we were in Georgia to have folks like that to uh, to work with, and uh, and it's uh, uh, it's it's a good memory and. Uh, I recall someone saying, "Hey, with 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 folks like you have uh, that, uh, that lead in the state, uh, Superintendent Woods, uh, uh, Governor Governor and Mrs. Deal, and 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 then the, the following uh, following that meeting, we had, we had gone to uh, D.C. for a uh, for the, the the government affairs conference for NASB, and and Johnny Isaacson spoke to us, and and." And and Johnny, you wouldn't you know he, you weren't wouldn't be impressed by his uh, by by his getting in, but once he stepped behind there, everybody said, "Gosh, the people in Georgia, the board in Georgia, the the systems, the ed educators in Georgia have to be the most blessed people on the planet." And that, that's a good memory. And uh, Mrs. Deal and Governor Deal certainly part of that. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I couldn't agree more. Mr. Royal mentioned something that hasn't been mentioned yet because everybody knows to meet Sandra was the love to Miss Sandra. If you didn't like Miss Sandra, you had a problem. It wasn't her. But prayers, especially for Governor Deal. 
And it's saying we have the opportunity and have been blessed with the opportunity through the leadership roles on the board to see behind the curtain a lot. And a lot of folks down there don't get to see behind the curtain. The genuine love that they had for each other, it was amazing. Uh, they are role models of how to be good parents, how to be good, a uh, good father and mother, and just good citizens. And prayers for uh, Governor Deal because he lost his best friend. Ms. Kenamore, Mrs. Deal, she was um, very special. She wasn't just the first lady of this state; she was my mentor. And um, the deals are just amazing people. And just continue to hold up Governor Dill in your prayer. I talked to him a couple of days ago, and uh, it's hard. It's really hard. And uh, they just love um, the state and education. And the Sandra Donegan Deal Center for um, uh, out in Excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah, you take your time. Um, yeah, that was um, brought together for um, namesake of uh, Mrs. Deal. And they are doing extraordinary work. And I was asked to be a board member on that for her. But just continue to keep the uh, Deal family in your prayers in the coming days, months, and weeks. And, and remember what Miss Deal used to always say. Just be nice. <laughs> <laughs> you could use that. I could use that. Mr. Mason. Uh, I uh, just want to uh, be able to, Mr. Superintendent, celebrate uh, the great things that your team, your staff does. Uh, um, last month, um, SREB has their annual conference. It was the first conference in a number of years we did in person in Texas, and uh, Ms. Johnson presented um, real stories of school improvement. And uh, so we have over 3,000 educators there, and you all know Stephanie is, um, she's a dynamo, she's a powerhouse, but she still can talk shop with anyone that cares about kids. And she did that in the presentation and had from a diverse audience of MTSS experts, school teachers, principal, you had you had some of everyone there, and they were they were beating up my email trying to get her presentation. So I just want to let you know that that your the the work that your team does is is well worth of national attention, and it should be celebrated. Um, and also, those of you all know uh, Dr. Jean Bottoms, who is retired from SREB, uh, came out with a new book, oh, wow. Tomorrow's High Schools. <laughs> Miss Johnson is the inspiration for Chapter 10 called wow. Acting on Our Beliefs to Achieve Bold Goals and Transform Our Schools. Wow. So let's give Miss Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Kenneth, did you tell her you were going to do that? I did not. <laughs> I did. She has no. I did. I said, oh, okay. I said, be ready. There's, there, there's no catcher off guard, so. Yeah. Well, um, I've tried to make sure that I, I know that staff doesn't like surprises, but I saw I tipped her off, but that was outstanding. And, Steffi, we really appreciate the work you and your team do, as we do the rest of the team here in any reflections or reactions? Because I know they were hungry for more. Well, first I want to just thank Mr. Woods for the opportunity. Yes. And I, and I just want to just say that to just have the role. I'll just mention that because he um, he does believe that you know we're going to lead the way in the state of Georgia if we're going to work here, and you know he um, has allowed me to kind of just do my own thing with my creating opportunities and just wanting to get down to making sure every child has what they need. So I thank you for that support. And I want to thank you and the whole board. First of all, thank you very much for um, allowing me to even go and talk to all the educators. I really believe their standard of practice and that everyone has the heart to want to serve. People just don't know how. 
sometimes they just don't know how because the situations are different. So those that of us that I say have been in the fire, right. it is our mission, and it should be what well, should be our mission and goal is to make sure that other educators know like what's available and what they can do, and that there is no such thing as I've done all I can do if there's still a child that's not learning. And that was just the overall um, goal of that presentation to show everyone, no matter whether we had teachers, better from teachers, superintendents, <coughs> state leaders in there. Uh, I've already had conversations with four different states that were represented there and two that were there and they um, didn't burn in mind. They were like, I had no idea that you were, you were presenting at that time when we would have been there, but to talk to them about what can happen. You know, I think too many people get defeated and call it burnout. I don't think it's burnout. I think it's complacency sometimes that, you know, that, hey, I can't go beyond my level of being able to continuously learn and we hopefully we stretch that. So thank you very much. And I just thank all of you all because you always support me and I always feel supported when I come to this. Like I don't feel like I have to sugarcoat anything. I feel like I can tell you just like it is or why I'm doing something and that you're gonna support it. And it's not a, I'm not thanking you for saying yes. I'm thanking you for having the heart and passion to want to do uh, well by every child in this state. And if, if I ever ask something that's a no, it's just a no. You know, I'm, I'm fine with that if that ever happens. But um, just so many thanks. And to my colleagues, that because they definitely made that presentation. <coughs> um, without the collaboration of all of the teams right. here, my team could not do what we do in the field every day. I mean, and that's everybody. Keith Osborne, we were on a, we were in a meeting this morning before we got here for an hour driving in, you know, but it's everybody contributing. And that's just what what's making Georgia, people have no idea why we're moving so quickly. It's because we're moving in collaboration of really great minds of people who are passionate. So thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Keith. <laughs> Board members? I just have one. Comment. Richard John. I again want to say thank you to Stephanie again. Of course, uh, I always tell the story. The first time I got to visit Stephanie when she was at Maynard Jackson, I came back, told Matt, I got to have her. Okay. <laughs> that was, that was the first day. So uh, we were glad to, you know, to be able to make that happen and appreciate her work and what she does. So uh, as with everyone, I, I, I think it's so important that you assemble the best team you possibly can. Um, you know, it'd be great to say I could, you know, do everything and have everything, but that's just an impossibility. And you learn uh, how important it is to rely on others around you, and you have to surround yourself with really good people. And uh, you know, Phil, we, we have a, an amazing team here, uh, the envy of any state. I think that when when I go out and meet again, it's always the question, "How are you doing this?" And you know, and I think it's just uh, you know having a belief that where we set out, we have a mission, we stay on focus with that. Um, uh, we just keep pounding the pavement, and we've done a good job. And you know, I think we should be you know, very proud of, of who we have up here, uh, because as I tell people, I mean, I'm, I'm an old coach, so uh, there's only one place I want to be. That's number one, you know, in a positive way. And uh, and I always kind of joke with my counterparts. I'm glad the other 49 states are fighting for number two. So you know, it's uh, uh, we want to make sure that we do offer the best, because if we're offering the best, that means we're supporting our kids at the fullest and, and our educators as well. Um, to the Dill family, again, condolences there. Uh, this deal, you know, the only word I can think of is first class. I mean, there was there was nothing uh, that I could say that, you know, she was just an amazing lady. When you see the hear about the epitome of a Southern lady, there is Miss Dill. Uh, never a crossword, always a smile, always encouraging. And I think for. Uh, you know, a proponent and spokesperson for public education, you couldn't find a better person, and especially in the area of reading. I think, uh, you know, as you know how big Georgia is, read in every single school system. Uh, that takes a lot of time, and that takes a lot of commitment. And I can only imagine if you're just focusing on education, but when you're underneath the governorship, that's, you know, uh, I mean, that, that's a time sink that I can't even, you know, say. But, she believed in public education that much. She believed in kids that much, and uh, definitely we missed. And again, to the governor Dale and his family, uh, my my deepest condolences as well. Thank you. Stand
Yeah, one, one more thing. John, yes. I, I don't know if everyone has seen, but our own, uh, on the cover of James Magazine, the education issue, the, the current issue, is our own teacher of the year and fellow colleague on the board, Michael Cavito. So uh, we'll make sure that uh, we recognize and honor him and uh, uh, for uh, not only being here, but being famous. <laughs> The fun fact is my wife took that picture. Hey, so Rick Towns is a pretty person. is the one who made that picture. And she is. I had an opportunity to meet and talk with her. She is. There are a lot of metaphors from that picture to the work that goes on here. Yeah. Think about that. We'll come back to that another time. Um, I want to close this way. Uh, first of all, Kenneth talked about Gene Bottoms. We've all talked about Sandra Deal. Great teachers may, meet, may leave the classroom, but they never retire. And Miss Deal was an educator and a teacher her entire life to the very end. She always had a lesson. And Jean Bottoms is the same way. Uh, Principals, those of you that are going back to your schools, I want I want first want to thank you, congratulate you for the recognition. I want to thank you for your service. And I want you to share with your staff when you get back home that the state board thanks them for their service. It's never been harder to do what they do than it is right now. But with that difficulty can also come some great reward. So please know that the State Board thanks them for their service every day on behalf of the children of Georgia. Um, I, my, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, Michael and I have already had conversations. Uh, you, some of you don't know this, uh, some of you do. Uh, I once held the same position that Michael currently does as a high school band director and uh, it seems like it's been a hundred years ago that I left the classroom, uh, but I told uh, uh, an audience at the Georgia School Board as a conference, uh, association conference back in June that when I get up in the morning, I still kind of think of myself as a musician. That's kind of gone on to do other things because it becomes who you are. Now, don't worry, you're not going to be subjected to uh, concerts here at every state board meeting, although I'm sure Mr. Kabita would be happy to oblige, but um, I do, I'm mindful that when uh, Keith put things up on the, on the screen, he has data not just for language arts, not just for math, not just for social studies, but for the arts. I know that Superintendent Woods has, places a very high value on that. Uh, those of you that were lucky enough to be at the GSBA conference, Heard a choral group from um, the, the McCraney uh, McCullers High School uh, for the Performing Arts in Muskogee County. And to bring this all for full circle, I want to say that when you listen to those young musicians perform, and I think Michael would agree with this, I don't think they're ever more mentally healthy than they are at that moment when they're performing together as an ensemble under the direction of an expert teacher sharing their ability and talent. Well, we, whether we're just music lovers or active musicians, it doesn't really matter. That's the metaphor for the work we all do in this state. Whether we're a listener, a composer, or a performer, we are at our most mentally healthy when we are doing what is rewarding, when we have support, when we do it together, and we stick to it, and we stay with the message. So my closing comments today, um, with all that has gone on and the year that we have to look forward to, is that we try to keep that metaphor in mind, that we, all of us together can get us to where the superintendent and this board wants us to go, which is to be the best public school system in this country. And uh, we'll hear more from other board members. 
Those of you that have sat in this seat, I've never appreciated you more than I do right now. Uh, and I'm also mindful that Senator Isaacson once sat in this seat, and it's very humbling. But uh, with that, I'll close my remarks. And uh, if there are no other uh, things for the good of the order, I entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. We are adjourned. See you in September. I thought you were going to say we're starting to take more bands.